and it's Bree. I'm back. <laughs> Welcome back, Bree. Welcome to <laughs> season two, episode five, where we are going to be talking about the Fairmont Hotel McDonald's in Edmonton, Alberta, Waterfront Station in downtown Vancouver, BC, Auberge Le Saint Gabriel in Old Montreal, Quebec. And for our paramedia segment, we're going to be talking about the 1973 film, The Exorcist. Yep, excited about that one. Me too. I'm looking forward to that. So getting right into it, we're going to start talking about the Fairmont Hotel McDonald in Edmonton, Alberta. So the Fairmont Hotel McDonald opened July 5th of 1915. Construction was from 1911 to 1915, and it was owned by the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway from 1911 to 1919. Common names for the hotel is Hotel McDonald. It was also known as the Mac, and then finally uh, renamed the Fairmont Hotel McDonald. It's located in downtown Edmonton, and it overlooks North Saskatchewan River. It has 11 floors, 198 rooms, and one restaurant called the Harvest Room. Many hotel suites named after its guests like King George VI, Queen Elizabeth, and Winston Churchill all have a suite dedicated in their honor. The building has many venue and event spaces. It has a lot of amenities including a squash court and gyms. In 1919, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway was bankrupt. The hotel was operated by the Canadian National Hotel, a division of the Canadian National Railway. A reno took place in 1953, adding 292 rooms called the Box. In 1983, the Canadian National Railroad closed the hotel, tore down the Box, In 1988, the hotel was sold to the Canadian Pacific Hotels, which the hotel underwent a three-year, $28 million renovation and reopened on May 15, 1991. In 2001, it adopted the Fairmont brand and became the Fairmont Hotel McDonald's. So that brings us kind of right up to current day and... I, I don't know when you were looking at it, Brie. It, it was a very grand hotel, as most of the grand trunk railway hotels are. Um, they almost look castle-like, um, in a sense, and uh, have a lot of uh, distinguishing characters to them. Mm-hmm. Right, and, and also along with, you know ghosts that come along with it as well so i'm going to pass it over to brie to start talking about some of the experiences that have happened at the hotel mcdonald's all right so um there's actually a lot going yeah. on at the, the hotel at mcdonald's yeah it's kind um, of going on <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So, apparently, guests who stay on the eighth floor seem to hear a horse galloping down the hallway, back and forth. Uh, It's also been said that, yeah, it's also been said that back when they um, were pouring the foundation for the hotel in 1914, one of the workers' horses suddenly dropped dead from exhaustion while pouring the concrete. And it can be heard on the eighth floor and sometimes in the basement, um, always heard but never seen. That's crazy. Mm Mm-hmm. And then there was a guest that was in one of the hotel's executive suites, and they reported seeing a man sitting in the chair smoking a pipe. Um, the boatman, boat man, is said to be the spirit of a sailor from the North Saskatchewan River. And the river was a, a major route for trade always going back and forth. Huh. And then I think there was, uh, there was a night manager, or actually maybe a couple of night managers, um, they'll get calls from rooms on the sixth floor, and when they go up to check on them, the rooms are vacant. <laughs> Nothing's in there. <laughs> so, so a playful ghost. Uh, once uh, one of the hotel engineers were working on the sixth floor, only to find out that one room had been dead bolted from the inside. When they finally got inside the room, it was completely empty. It's not like, didn't we read it, something about another room that was bolted from the inside? Yeah. 
And then they like painted over it and everything. Yeah, like I think the that walls was like the, made the. I think that was the Banff Springs Hotel. Hmm. That was a very haunted room too. Yeah. And most people go looking for it and they can't find it. Hmm. So in this hotel, it's the eighth floor and the sixth floor. They talk a lot about. Hmm. Oh, there's also in a staff only area. <laughs> Uh, known as the Royal Service or the Switchboard. Two workers were there together when uh, they suddenly heard music playing, and it was like old 50s style kind of music. Neither remembered the station, and when they checked, they realized that it was turned off. Uh, they never found out where the music came from, but it was fitting that during the t period that CBC Radio was broadcast from the top of the hotel because it was the tallest building at the time. Oh, wow, crazy. And that is all I have about the ghosts. Of McDonald Hotel. Wow. Well, there's a lot of information there and a lot of interesting mm -hmm. things. and Different ghosts, too. Yeah. Many different um, entities there that people experience and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Because usually, usually they stay in the same area, right? So mm. they're going to have one ghost that's going to be randomly here and there. and <laughs> Just random, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think they just tend to stick to the same the area that they were drawn to to begin with. Yeah, but you know, I I have said in past episodes that I think you know they kind of there are some that pass through as well. Well, there's spirits and then there's ghosts that are apparently different True. apparitions. So. True. Is that everything for the ghosts for the Fairmont Hotel McDonald's? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're going to move right along to Waterfront Station, which is located in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia. And it was built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. And it opened on August 1st of 1914. It was the main Pacific terminal connecting passenger trains from Montreal, Quebec and Toronto, Ontario. And some some dates um, that I, I've seen over and over and over again when I'm researching this uh, waterfront station is in 1977, the sea bus opens, uh, connects Vancouver to North Vancouver. 1985, there was a SkyTrain uh, opening. There was an Expo line, uh, had something to do with Expo 86. And it also linked the cities of Vancouver, Burnaby, and New Westminster, and Surrey, B.C. And 1995, they have a West Coast Express that opened, which links uh, Metro Vancouver to the Fraser Valley Regional District. And in 2009, the SkyTrain Canada line opened, which takes Vancouver to Central Richmond and to the airport. Um, but definitely, um, this station is like almost like it's hustle and bustling at all the times. Like it was definitely needed for uh, the Vancouver hub, and it's right on the water. So they actually have, uh, like I was saying earlier, the sea bus that's goes along the sea to to different points and what have you as well so i found that really interesting because uh, we don't really have anything like that here but i found it also interesting that even though to this day um this station is as busy as ever and they're always adding things to it to make it uh make it more better for its commuters and and what have you so but as always, this is a paranormal show, so there's got to be some paranormal in there somewhere. So I'm going to pass it over to Bree to tell us about the ghosts of Waterfront Station. Thank you very much, Em. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's uh, quite a few ghosts here, ghost stories for Waterfront Station. Yeah. Um. So there's been many nighttime guards that have witnessed apparitions and activities going on. And there it goes, the apparitions. Everybody uses a different term when they describe what they're talking about. Some say ghosts, some say spirits, some say apparitions. Yeah, so true. Uh, there was one night guard. He saw a woman in like a 1920s flapper style dress. She was dancing along on the corridor in the west side of the building. And he could hear the 20s music as well as she danced. When he started to approach her, the music stopped and then she disappeared. <laughs> That's spooky. 
Yeah, that would be pretty creepy. And like, imagine that person and how they feel after having yeah. an experience like that. Um, there was a, another uh, guard was patrolling the northwest corner of the building and went into the empty room with only a flashlight with him. Yeah. He got frightened by an old woman who was glowing like um, a phosphorus white, and she had like a mournful look on her face. As he was there, scared, she went to reach out, and he was so scared, he just took off. He just turned around <laughs> and ran. Yeah, he's like, bye. <laughs> like, say, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. I wonder what would have happened. He should have just let him. I mean, you know, it could have been cold. It could have been nothing. Yeah, it could have been. Like, I mean, but, like, I just, I guess what I don't understand, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like every time you you hear about a ghost sighting or happening, it's trying to either say something or it's gesturing mm-hmm. or something. Mm-hmm. It's obviously there for a purpose. So why, yeah. when everybody approaches them, they disappear? Yeah. You know, stick around. Tell us what you want. Maybe we can help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not all mind readers, you know. I know, right? <laughs> Just because you're an apparition doesn't mean you have <laughs> special privileges. <laughs> so there was this other guard. He was being haunted by a woman at the station. Like, he was in the old kitchen. Personally? Like it yeah. was haunting him? Wow. Yeah, listen to this. So he was in the old kitchen and he saw the old woman and he came face to face with her. And when she looked at him, it was so intense. And all of a sudden she started to float towards him. And he started to panic and took off running down, <laughs> running <laughs> out of course again. I'm wondering if that's the same guard with the same Oh, woman. it said it was another guard. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't wow. the same guy. Oh, that's good. So apparently, well, the other guy said, the other guy said he saw her, but this one here says that he was haunted by the ghost. Wow. So, yeah, so apparently he goes running out of the room, and after that, he started to dream about her every night. He saw her in the mirrors, he saw her in window reflections, and then he all of a sudden had this urge to paint, (laughs) and it was like, I guess, an image of her. He just couldn't really paint, (laughs) so... I guess it didn't turn out very well. And then he did that. Oh, sorry. So he, after he painted it, he brought it to the uh, the kitchen where yeah. he saw her and left right. it there. And then he never saw her again. Oh. That's interesting. Yeah, that is kind of interesting. Almost like you, you recognized me, you painted me, and I'm good. You know me now. Uh-huh. You know? Uh-huh. It's hmm. different. Yeah, that is different. I've never really... I wonder what made him think of that. Yeah. Or what... Was it maybe the apparition that inspired him? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Makes me think that maybe she was a painter. Maybe. That's what I was thinking. Hmm. You know? Uh, So then there was another guard. Another guard, not the same one. He was up on the upper level on the east side. And he was on control. And he was walking through a room with the old, uh, with some old desk. As he walked through, the desk began to move together with him, <laughs> but it wasn't making any sound. So as he turned to leave the room, he realized he was blocked by the, I guess it was more than one desk. So he was a little bit frightened. He leapt on top of them and took off <laughs> out of the room. Wow. So it was almost like they were following him, like dragging along the ground. Mm-hmm. It's very creepy. Yeah. These are some very creepy stories. Yeah. I need to go there. What is this place called again? <laughs> <laughs> it's Waterfront Station. <laughs> I need to go there. Of course you can go there. You can go to Vancouver and, and take a train. Especially from the guard. I know. Mm-hmm. It'd be nice to interview them. So yeah, if you're listening. Cool. So the, apparently there was quite a few security guards that have also heard phantom te- uh, footsteps on the tile floors in the building late at night. Nobody else is around. Wow. Other people have claimed seeing the ghost of three old ladies sitting on a bench as if waiting for the train that never comes. Outside the station on the railroad tracks there, uh, north of the building, the ghost of a rail worker is seen on rainy nights. Uh, back in 1928, apparently a brakeman by the name of Hub Clark was killed while making repairs in the rail yard. 
he slipped and fell on the wet tracks and was knocked unconscious. Um, horrifically, a passenger train came by and ran him over, decapitating him. Since oh. the incident, some I know. Since the incident, some have said uh, to see the headless brakeman roaming the tracks with the, his lantern glowing in his hand. Um, others say he has been seen in different parts of the gas town as well. But I remember, didn't we read? There was another ghost like this that had. Yeah, it was the St. Louis ghost train. Yeah. A brake man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the one that Canada Post made that stamp about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So similar kind well, of Well, yeah. that is it for the ghost of Waterfront Station in Vancouver, BC for me. Well, that was really cool. Like, that was really interesting. Like, I really enjoyed the... Uh, the stories there, and they were very different mm-hmm. than than what yeah. we're used to. Mm, I like that. That makes me. I I want to go there just to see for myself. Now. <laughs> I know. I know. Even I want to go there. And that's rare. I wonder if they have a hiking trail near there, and you can stay at that hotel. It's possible. That'd be cool. Yeah, but it would be good to kind of check out around in and around that area because it seems very active. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd like to go there. Yeah. That'd be cool. All right. So we're going to move along and we're going to talk about Auberge Le Saint Gabriel, uh, which is an inn and restaurant that is located in old Montreal, Quebec. And it was established in 1754. Uh, the The inn was the first establishment to be granted an alcohol license. Uh, it was originally built a two-story house in 1688 by a French soldier. And in 1754, it was converted to North America's first inn. And it was equipped with long, narrow corridors made of stone. So very creepy. Um, lots of character, though. <laughs> but it still has that like creepy kind of feel to it for certain locations within the um, inn and also within the restaurant. Oh, yeah, yeah. In 1987, co-owned by Marc Bollet and his family bought the inn and they are taking the restaurant and the inn to new heights and guests have nothing but good things to say, really good things to say about um, the food and the atmosphere and, and what they have to offer there and what they've done with the place as well. So I know this one doesn't have a very extensive ghost history, but it has a ghost and everybody deserves the five minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to pass it <laughs> over to one. Bree <laughs> for the ghost of the Auberge Le Saint Gabriel. Bree? Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty. So, it is rumored to be haunted by the ghost of a little girl who died in a fire during the 19th century. Uh, apparently, she can be heard playing the piano from time to time and haunts this place until today. That is all I have for the ghost of Auberge Le Saint Gabriel. As we said, very light on the ghost information, but you know, she's she's definitely known to um, kind of pop up. There's been a lot of reports of cold spots um, and different different in different areas of the building. Um, and as Bree was saying, um, you could hear her playing the piano as well. So kind of creepy. Imagine if you were there, you know, having dinner, or staying, and you, all of a sudden you hear a piano at us somewhere. Uh-huh. That'd be funny. <laughs> but yeah, so that's it for for the Auberge Le Saint Gabriel Inn and Restaurant. So now we're going to move on to our paramedia section of the show where we are going to talk about the 1973 film The Exorcist. Take it away, (laughs) Brie. All right. So this is one of my favorite movies of all time. I know. It was also a movie that haunted me for most of my life. Yes. You said no. I hope you're going to tell that story. Yes, I will. 
So okay. I was about, I don't know, six or seven when I saw this movie. And I remember we were at one of my relatives' houses and they were all playing cards at the table. It was like typical get together. Um, and my cousin and I, I don't remember any other kids. I think it was just him and I at the time. Um, we were watching TV and I don't know if somebody put this on or it, <laughs> if it just turned into this because we always had late nights with the family, right? And uh, the exorcist happened to be playing. So my cousin didn't last very long. <laughs> I think he ran out of the room when she first changed and her face was all like <laughs> demonic. <laughs> I remember seeing him running out of the room. <laughs> I didn't leave. I think I was just too freaked out. I don't know. I don't remember leaving and then coming back, but he came back eventually. <laughs> you were compelled but to that watch movie it. haunted me since that day. <laughs> I was probably, I don't know, 17 or 18 when I finally stopped having that horrible dream about her. Her wow. nightmare. Yeah, it was bad. It was, and it wouldn't happen every day, but every now and then it would just pop in there, and it would be the worst nightmare ever. But anyways, okay, so about the movie, which is very good. <laughs> that was, <laughs> like Sean said, it was in the 1973. So back then, you know, religious things with the devil and demonic was very scary. It's like everybody was very fearful of this. Um, but it was a a story about a girl who was possessed. And as they were filming the, the movie, the set caught on fire and it literally burned everything down except for Reagan's room. Her room was completely undamaged. The staff and wow. the crew, sorry, I guess more the crew than anything, but the crew were so freaked out that they called in a priest to bless the set. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. But crazy things happen, not just that, like, Linda Blair, I believe she's mentioned it either on a show or in one of her book, in a book. Like I, I don't know if she has a documentary to tell you the truth, but <clears throat> I've seen her on talk shows. And uh, even she talks about the one uh, apparatus that was holding her to make her look like she was having convulsions. She actually fractured her spine during that. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's and serious then, stuff. Yeah. And she was, what, 12 years old at the time? Wow. And then the mom, the lady who played mo the mom, Ellen Bernstein, she was injured during one of the scenes where Reagan slapped her. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing that. Kind of slapped her and she kind of fell back and, and they actually, her screaming from in being in pain was actually left in the movie. Mm, right, yeah, because they um, yanked her too hard with the apparatus or the harness when they pulled her to fly her across the room. Wow. Yeah. Even some of the imagery in that movie, um, even, what's the word I'm looking for? It's almost like it's um, subliminal messaging because you get those flashes of Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, for images. sure, because they want to freak you out. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever catch yourself, yeah. like, rewinding and trying to, like, pause on yeah. that spot? To see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you're like oh god what is it <laughs> yeah. and, and then you go what was that and then you start to question yourself did I actually see something there? <laughs> um, so apparently there was um, some deaths that were tied to the movie too including I'm sure Linda Blair's father grandfather sorry um, wow. guy Matt, Max's brother two supporting actors and a special effects expert and then apparently, I read this, I can't remember if it was on Wikipedia, but uh, Paul Bateson, who later confessed to murder, appeared as a radio, radiological tech in the film. Really? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of like negativity attached to that movie. That's yeah, for sure. yeah, for Very sure. Scary. Yeah. Hmm. So, well, like, the people, the. Uh, you got was the poltergeist you guys talked about last time, right? Mm -hmm. a, it, a lot of people tie that when you're telling a story about something that it's like powerful, I guess, or negative, or it affects the energy. Yeah, it's almost like mm -hmm. the sets are cursed. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like there's there's more at work here than what we can see with the eye. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's not a thinking. Yeah, because in that sense, you 
I guess, you know, just like anything, you stir it up, it's going to come knocking, right? <laughs> Exactly. That's why I don't play with the Ouija boards. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. I kind of stay away from those. <laughs> not for me. Yeah, I do. No. <laughs> so not only that, they have um, like the the clay figurines they used in the movie too. They were very demonic looking. Yeah. And every time you saw them in the movie, they played that horrible, horrible, evil music. So <laughs> yeah. you felt that negativity. You felt that that was not a good thing. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. No, they, they were very good back then with making things scary. I find nowadays things not really scary. It's more gory. Yeah, it's more I mean, Don't get me wrong. I love gore. I love gore because I'm a Texas Chainsaw Massacre fan 100%. I've seen them all. I've seen them all. Yeah, same here as well, but I, I, and I think I mentioned this in the last show as well, talking about the poltergeist, is that every effect is, like, man-made. So there's no real computer-generated other than animation at that point. So Oh, right, yeah, everything's yeah. authentic. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, you get more of a real scare there because you have that human element added to it as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I think that was it. I think that was it that I found. The fire was the biggest thing. I think yeah. I can't even remember if it was towards the end of the movie or if it was at the beginning of the movie. I don't think it's specified. But... Because everybody was so freaked out, I, I would assume they were probably like halfway through the filming. It, it probably started to happen around the time that she was getting possessed. Yeah, yeah. So, there was another movie. I know it's not a horror movie, but do you remember hearing about the Passion of the Christ? What happened to the guy that was on the cross? No. Oh, didn't he? Was, didn't he get electrocuted? Yeah, he was like yeah. I think it was either the equipment or uh, lightning, like from outside. I actually think he got electrocuted twice. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> what are the chances, crazy. right? I know but that right? could be a movie that we'll cover down the road. You yeah, never know. Maybe. You never yeah. know. <laughs> All right. Anything more for The Exorcist? No, that's it. All right. So that brings us to another end of an episode. Again, we want to thank you for joining us and uh, listening to the stories that we have. And Bree, do you want to fill us in on how everybody can get in touch with us? I sure can. <laughs> so <laughs> you can reach us at our email, which is paranormalfilescanada at gmail.com. You can reach us on Twitter at PFC underscore Sean underscore Bree. Or you can reach us on Facebook at Paranormal Files Canada. And our Instagram at Canada Paranormal Files. Awesome. Thank you, Bree, for that. And also, no let us know how we're doing. You know, if there's a like button, hit it. If there's a comment button, comment. We'd love to hear from you. And we would also love to hear your stories as well. So, yeah, uh, for sure. Come on. Yeah, you know, nothing. we would love nothing more to put your story on our show. So, again, thank you for joining us for Season 2, Episode 5. And we look forward to seeing you next month with a whole new show. All right, so take care of yourself. And also don't forget to stay That's spooky. Okay.